This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt, felt right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I figured it out. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. Quick note, we have shows coming up in Boston, London, New York, and a special event in the Bay Area. StoryCollider.org for more information. This week's story is from Anissa Ramirez. The story was recorded in July 2014 at Littlefield in Brooklyn as part of our Sports Science Show. So when my parents got divorced, it was just the four of us. My mom, my two younger brothers, Dave and Mark, and myself. And growing up in Jersey City in the 70s, we didn't get to play outside much. It was a little risky. So we kept ourselves occupied inside. And my brothers, they took a different approach than I did. What they did is they watched a lot of television, and I just kind of hung out in my room and brooded. And when I did emerge, I would hang out with them and we'd watch shows like 3 to one Contact, Six Million Dollar Man. It was awesome. But the place where I couldn't really reach them and connect was football. There were all these words and terminology that I didn't understand. So we connected, but football was the place that I could not reach them. So I had this dream at a very early age of being a scientist. And that dream led me to eventually go and get, pursue a doctorate at Stanford in material science and engineering. And it's here that football and I met up again. You see, the graduate students were putting together an intramural flag football team, and the captain of the team reached out to me and asked me if I was interested in playing. I had a lot of pent-up aggression. (laughs) Sounds like a good idea. But then I followed up and said, by the way, don't count on me for any kind of athletic skill. He gave me a puzzled look. I had seen this look before. In grammar school, they used to always pick me first for dodgeball. I was good, but I was never the Michael Jordan that they expected. (laughs) And in high school, there was a big basketball game between the seniors and the teachers, and Sister Mary Frances wasn't dribbling the ball all that well, so I stole the ball, so I'm probably going to hell. (laughs) And I made my way up to make a layup, and I tossed the ball up, and it went over the glass. And all my teammates thought I was joking around. No, I suck at basketball. Don't throw the ball to me, please. You see, it's hard to be African American, a nerd, and have no athletic skill. People think you're holding out on them. I got nothing. So this expression that I had seen before with the coach, which I had seen before, I just said in the back of my mind, just you wait. Now, when I was playing this game, they would keep the directions very, very simple. Sometimes my job was to protect this guy. And sometimes my job was to kill that guy. Kill, protect, ones, zeros. They kept it binary, which I could handle. And because I didn't have a lot of background in football, he would teach me a couple of things. He taught me how to catch the ball, how to run with the ball, and most importantly, which direction to run with the ball. And to my surprise, I was actually good at intramural science graduate student flag football. (laughs) I could run and weave between people, which I attest to walking on New York streets. I was pretty fast. I'm I'm black. And, you know, I, I I actually have a football injury now. I was in the end zone, and the quarterback was very desperate, and he threw the ball to me and I caught it. And in the shock of actually catching the ball, I fell and twisted my knee. Now, there wasn't anybody around me. I just fell. 
But more importantly, that was the winning catch, and that's how I choose to remember it anyway. So that Christmas, I went home and asked for something unusual. I wanted a football. And when I got the football, my brother Dave taught me how to throw a spiral. Finally, angular momentum, it makes sense. And my brother Mark showed me a couple of different plays, so I was ready for the next season. It was great, the three of us hanging out together. Now, what I forgot to mention is that at Stanford, football was in the ether. It was electric. Stanford's team was very good, and the 49ers in the 1990s were doing extremely well. So I actually started watching 49ers on television. It was really hard not to be a football fan. So I got it. When I would go home for Thanksgiving and I saw my brothers glued in front of the television watching football, I totally got it. But I was kind of at the end of my career uh, since I was wrapping up my dissertation and there wouldn't be another intramural league, maybe as a postdoc or something like that. And they never played the 49ers on East Coast television. And I was actually getting deeper and deeper in my science. So I didn't really participate in that much. So I finished my doctorate at Stanford, and I got a job at New Jersey. I returned back to New Jersey, which I didn't think I was going to do. And I noticed something. After years of being inundated with red and gold, I now saw that northern Jersey was really New York Giants country, and I saw red, white, and blue everywhere. And New York Giants fever was big, particularly with my family. Well, as I mentioned at the top, my family was always us four, my mom, my two brothers, and I. But when I was in college, my mom got remarried to George. Now, I didn't know George all that well. We didn't get along fully. But what I do know about George is that he was a big New York Giants fan. And the interior of our house changed. There were New York Giants bath mats, gloves, pillows, blankets, mugs, T-shirts, artwork. I didn't know there was New York Giants artwork. <laughs> but we had it. But he grew very close to my brothers where football was the glue. So I was on the outside again, and football was the cause again. So I decided that I was going to rebel and be an anti-football snob. So they would have their Super Bowl party, I would have my anti-Super Bowl party. I would go to places that are very, very busy on the day of the Super Bowl. So the first time I tried this experiment, I went to Costco. That was awesome. The next year, I decided to be a little bit more cerebral and a little bit more creative, so I went to the Strand Bookstore. That was great. I went right up to the counter. So I was anti-football, and it stayed that way a long, long time. So my science career was going pretty well, and I got a position at Yale. And I had just started this position, which was sort of the pinnacle of my uh, scientific career. About four months into it, George died. That was devastating. We were back to us four, but it wasn't the same. And as I said, I tried to over, overlook George's love for the New York Giants, but it was really hard to do, especially on his funeral. Around his casket were red, white, and blue flowers. The top was festooned with red, white, and blue flowers. There was actually an arrangement of flowers in the shape of a New York Giants helmet. George loved his Giants. He really did. And we all inherited Giants stuff. Even I got Giants blankets. I didn't know what to do with them, but I accepted them. But we never, the four of us, never came back again. We never reconnected again. So I just went back into my happy place, and my happy place is science. So at Yale, I had a big research group, and I had students, and we were writing papers, and life was good. We were going to conferences, and I started teaching classes. I was teaching Intro to Material Science, which is an engineering class, and I love teaching this class. But, you know, you heard the word engineering and might be feeling a little sleepy because I've said that. So I tried to make the class exciting, and I would do crazy demonstrations. I would bring in a blowtorch for some things, and sometimes I would have current running through wires that were like lethal, just to get their attention. <laughs> and because I was doing these crazy things, I decided to videotape these things, and I made a, a series of material science videos that we called Material Marvels, and I posted them on YouTube. And one day, the cameraman said to me, you know, you should do a little video on the science of football. You like to explain stuff. And when he said that, all of my football history hit me at once. A 
part of me was repelled by that idea, and that was the anti-football snob that I had become, particularly at Yale. And another part of me loved the idea, and that was the teacher in me and the person who used to play intramural science graduate student football a long, long time ago. So I wrote a script, and that was the first time that both science and football were on the same page. Now, in the opening scene of this video for the science of football, we'd have two guys throwing a ball to each other, and then one of the guys would throw a ball to me, and then I'd launch into my spiel about the shape of the ball being a prolate spheroid and the spin of the ball, and just kind of go off from there. So the guys threw the ball to each other, and then one guy threw the ball to me, and when he threw the ball to me, I caught it so gracefully. In fact, they even noticed it. I wanted to say something about being black, but it didn't feel honest. <laughs> and when I, what I noticed is when I posted that video, that science of football video got way more hits than my material science videos. So I knew I had something, I just didn't know what it was. So the Super Bowl happened, and a few weeks after that, a literary agent reached out to me and said, hey, I have this crazy idea. I'd like to put you, a scientist, together with a sports writer and see what you can come up with in terms of a book. And the anti-football snob replied and just said, thanks, but, but no thanks. In my mind, I was thinking, look, I know enough to do a three-minute video, but a book, that's a different story. So I told my literary agent about that, and she went and talked to the guy, and she came back to me, and she's like, no, 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 it's not what you think. It's, it's football freakonomics that they want to do. Can you think about that? And that, that excited me. So an arranged marriage was put together between Alan St. John and myself to write a football book, a sports writer and a scientist. Now, Alan and I come from very, very different worlds. But when we talked... We're both passionate about our, our each topic. We had the best conversations I think I've ever had in my life. He would say something football-y, and I would say something science-ish. And we see that there was this connective tissue. He would talk about certain plays, and it would remind me of how atoms interact. And then we would start thinking about crazy questions, which is what the book is about. And so we'd ask, how does game theory happen on the gridiron? Why don't woodpeckers get concussions? Those are the kinds of questions that were interesting to me. And so these are the kinds of questions that we got to explore. So we were signed up to do Newton's football. And they signed me up not because I knew anything about football, but because I didn't. And being a football newbie actually was an asset, because when we talk all, to all these greats, like Jerry Rice, Don Shula, Sam Weish, I feel that they were much more open and much more vulnerable in their questions because I was just curious. So I would have these great conversations with these folks. I would hang up the phone, and I wouldn't know half of what people were saying. So fortunately for me, my youngest brother, Mark, lives nearby, and I would be bugging him every night. Okay, what is this word? Who is this guy? What's the history behind this? And Mark was very patient with my you know, very newbie questions. But he taught me. And now sometimes Mark would be a little bit more loquacious than I needed him to be. But I wouldn't cut him off. Not always, not like big sisters can. Because I was seeing another side of Mark that I hadn't seen before. He's kind of a football genius in my eyes. And under his tutelage, I was able to learn quite a bit. And I would also have conversations with my brother Dave, who lives further away, and the three of us would be on the phone talking about football. We were back. And so my, parent, my brothers were my Rosetta Stone to help me translate football into science and vice versa. And with that, I was able to create Newton's football. So Newton's football is a journey about a person who was an anti-football snob outsider who's now become a free, football of Freakonomics expert. And my family, we're a football family. My brothers... They like the New York Giants, and I secretly have a sweet spot for the 49ers. And football and I, we're cool. We're real cool. Thank you. That was Anissa Ramirez. 
Anissa is a science evangelist who is passionate about getting the general public excited about science. She co-authored Newton's Football and authored Save Our Science. She has appeared on NPR and CNN, gave a TED Talk in 2012, and blogs for the Huffington Post. She was a mechanical engineering professor at Yale for 10 years and received her doctorate in material science from Stanford. Based in New Haven, Connecticut, she is currently writing a book on the impact of technology on humans. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org. We have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love the podcast, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show and to sports for being a thing in the world as mysterious to me as science is to other people. Thanks for listening. How powerful is Cox Internet? Powerful enough to let your band members in Vegas, Phoenix, and Rhode Island jam like you're all in the same garage. Get Cox Internet powered by fiber with America's fastest download speeds. It's Internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, always building better. Cox Internet is connected to the premises via coaxial connection. Speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms and other restrictions may apply. Analysis by Ucalypt speed test intelligence data. Fixed median download speeds. USQ3 2023.